this, uh, I had a supervisor for, for being a therapist that he was the son of a preacher, and he said he learned from his father that the job of a preacher and a therapist is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> and I think that that's part of parenting also. And I think that there's a way with children who things come easy to them, like in the film, it's like, oh yeah, I, I was really good at that, and I want to just stick with that. And we have to push those kids. And the ones, you know, and, and, and the, you're not so special, the commencement speech, these are kids who have been told they're special all the time. The, the path has been cleared for them in a lot of ways and they have this advantage, and I think they need to be discomforted a little bit. Mm -hmm. But then there are children who need to be comforted. And the other thing I want to say about Amy's uh, Little White Donkey story is that when I see the adults in my practice who are the kind of the casualties of the extremes of the achieve, 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 I don't care what you think, I don't care what you want, and I compare that to Amy's stories, um, the difference is whether the child is seen, felt, heard, you know, with the, the kind of the saving grace, the reason I, reading the book, that I didn't have that, oh my God, you know, we're gonna lynch Amy Chua, you know, is that, the, that her daughters were able to say, I hate this, I hate you, I'm mad. Um, <laughs> and I think that as parents, we need to listen to that. Our children do get mad at us. And that adults in therapy, they always say, that their feelings were not welcome, they were not reflected, they weren't allowed to get angry, they weren't allowed to be sad, they weren't allowed to be scared, and that we have to welcome all of our children's feelings, and that's part of that comforting them. And at that point, it makes a big difference whether the child is being seen and heard, and, and when she tells you later, now I know I can do it, that what she's saying is, you were really seeing me in that moment, not what sometimes happens, which is, I had to practice the piano so much, and what I really wanted to be doing was X, Y, or Z, and they didn't know me. My parents did not know me, and that's a very painful thing. Right, and when you were just mentioning, you know, the path has been paved for so many of these kids, right. part of that is they don't want to hear the I hate you. It's actually really healthy for your kid to think that they were born into the wrong family, and that, you know, <laughs> maybe some switched at birth thing happened at the hospital. Um, you want them to, at some point, hate you, um, not for a prolonged period of time, but you, you want them to develop their own separation and individuation. Well, I call it something um, to bump up against, and uh, I, I talk a lot with parents who are on the attachment parenting side, the, you know, never let them have to walk or mm -hmm. cry or, or be alone or any of that, and, and uh, there's a lot in that. There's a, it builds connection. Um, it, it gives a sense of security, but what they often miss is something to bump up against. Right. And I often hear from them when the kids are four, and it's like, ah, it was like they, need to, they need to have a fight. Right, exactly. And so a lot of these kids who, because we don't want to upset them, we don't, you know, there are a lot of parents who um, won't have their kids do chores at home, which is just a basic family responsibility, but they're so busy with their homework and they're sleep deprived, and how can we do this? They're in the middle of this drawing and we can't interrupt their creativity to come <laughs> set the table. Um, you know, things like that. We don't like that our kids will get will get mad at us. Um, and so they grow up and they don't have sort of basic life skills. And um, Erica, I think you um, see this firsthand. I do see this firsthand and I'm conflicted because you know, as a parent and as an early educator, I see the value of the letting your child be creative and not putting such rigid um, limits on them and, and expectations. But at the same time, it, it becomes so dysfunctional. Uh, to be blunt. I mean, it does, you know, in my own family. And when I was a preschool teacher not terribly long ago, you know, we would have to put on a circus to get these little four-year-olds to clean up. <laughs> you know, in the old days, they had a sort of intrinsic motivation to want to participate in a group activity that was helpful to everyone. You know, so we're, we are raising kids who um, have trouble doing these things. We see at Harvard, I assume this is what you're asking me about, um, you know, some really crazy stories. Uh, and maybe I could share a oh, couple yeah. of them. That'd be great. Um, you know, I have an email that was sent to a professor, um, and I, I will edit it <laughs> for privacy <laughs> and length. Uh, but this gives you an example. Now, this is not a typical. I mean, these are the outliers, but it's always fun to talk about the outliers. So here we go. Um, <laughs> Hi, prof. You know, that's a uh, formal salutation, just in case you're <laughs> um, I attended lecture yesterday and found out that we have an exam due in the course last week. 
I'm sorry, that we had an exam due. Until the lecturer mentioned it yesterday, I was oblivious to the fact that we had one for this course. <laughs> My attempts to notify you of this yesterday didn't pan out. <laughs> <laughs> Upon my subsequent re-inspection of the syllabus, I also noticed that there were two reading assignments due before the midterm. Those two I didn't know were due at any particular time. Let me interrupt. This is Harvard. <laughs> I am, wait, I am completely astonished about these revelations. <laughs> and I'm not sure how this happened. I'm also surprised that you didn't notify me of my failure, of my failure to complete these assignments. What do you suggest we do? Mm -hmm. 